And welcome to Habs Unfiltered. I'm your host, Blaine Pudbank. Uh, this week, I'm joined by my co-host, Treg Wilson. Hello, hello. And the cougar thirst trap himself, Matt Smith. Good afternoon, guys. Happy New Year. Who has his own, who has an OnlyFans page if you yes. want to uh, join up for it. If you want to see more of Matt, join the Habs Unfiltered OnlyFans page, and uh, you'll see p- pictures of Matt. We might even sell his underwear. <laughs> They're branded underwear. They're not necessarily ones he's worn. We cannot guarantee that. (laughs) For hygienic reasons, of course. Yeah, of course. course. COVID age, you don't want to be spreading that. This isn't Japan and vending machines. so That's right. (laughs) And and COVID can be spread uh, spread through farts, so we don't want to be doing that. (laughs) So, uh, all right. So, it's the new year. We've all made resolutions. I, for one, I'm going to do a push-up every time Treg posts a selfie. And I'm going to post a selfie every five minutes. <laughs> I'm going to be jacked. <laughs> and soon, you'll look, soon you'll look like me. No, no. no I, I'll be tall and good-looking. Instead of short and not good-looking. I get it. I get what you're yeah. saying. Yeah. That's why COVID is the perfect time for you. Everyone has to wear a mask so no one can tell. It's true. It's true. true. I had a guy on Twitter tell me never shave the beard. I don't know if that was a compliment or not. (laughs) (laughs) I just went, thanks. (laughs) Yeah, there's nothing like those random name with eight numbers telling you what to do. Oh, no, this was a regular follower. This was a, I'm assuming it was a, a good thing, but you never know. Sounds like something Gibby would say. <laughs> yeah, Gibby's burner account. Send yeah. me more pictures, Treg. <laughs> <laughs> Gibby acts like he doesn't want to see the selfies, but really, he's looking. He does. <laughs> he was chucking crap at us on his show on Twitch. Apparently, Ooh. they got a Twitch channel. Ooh. And his Twitch is a nervous Twitch. He's like, "Oh, uh, I don't like the OnlyFans page because Matt's too pretty." Uh, uh. Hey, they got Vin. They're pretty boys, Vin. Exactly. Vin so, would do very well in jail. Yes, he would. <laughs> or on a Canadian frigate on a seven-month deployment when you can't go ashore. <laughs> He's a three ashore and a seven at sea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we all know those ones. So... Uh, um, Anyway, enough enough fluffing the each other on this intro. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit of the world. Uh, we're going to kick it off with some World Juniors talk. So why don't you kick us off there, Matt? What do you think? What did you think of the the, uh, the round robin this year? So the round, well, I'll start with Canada, obviously. It's the team that we always watch the most. Um, I, 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 th- I think Canada hit the ground running. Um they, they played a depleted German roster and uh, really kind of had their way with them. But, you know, what, what do you, what do you expect really? Like when you're, when you're playing against a team that's got 14 players on the ice, it doesn't matter really that you've got Stutzel, Pertaka, et cetera, on the ice. It's, you're going to, you're going to, all you got to do is shut down that line and, and score by committee. And that's what they did. Um, there were, there were definitely some standouts, um, from Canada and um, I believe some players stood up a little bit more as the tournament went went on Um, the thing that surprised me the most is how how much issues they had against Slovakia a a, a team that um, a team that didn't even qualify for the uh, actually wait a minute they did yes they did get into the quarters Um, but for, for for a team that that struggled um, I, I, it just kind of threw me off that um, they 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 played against Finland so well, and they were all over them, and they played some dominant hockey against a team that uh, has has won some gold medals over the last couple of years. And then you you look at their performance against Slovakia, and you're just like, where, like, what's going on? Like the guys couldn't complete a pass or anything. But um, overall. Um, guys like Dylan Cousins, they really uh, they really stepped up when needed. 
Um, Byfield had that one good game, but I'm hoping that that is going to be a, a step in the right direction because we saw how positive he was after the game and the fact that they need to get that, they need to get him going. He's a, he's a big body. He, yes, he's young. He's still learning how to use his body um, at this level. And um, he's going to need to do that, especially at the NHL level. But um, guys like, uh, you know, Tomasino stepped up big time. Uh, Peltier, um, these, these, these lines have, have really started to come together. We're still trying to figure out if, uh, if Newhook is going to play or not. Apparently he's 50-50 for the next game. Um, but this is, this is when it counts. This is when, uh, this is when uh, you know, you lose, you're out. So, you know, yeah, and it's not uh, it's not like a best of seven series here. It's it's a one for it's a one game playoff. So, yeah. I mean, you don't have to be the best team. You just have to be hell. You can be lucky. One yeah. game is all, and you're out. The thing that's the thing that's uh, that I'm kind of a little wary about is Devin Levy. Um, I've I've spoke very good things of him since the draft. The only thing that worries me a little bit is the fact that he hasn't truly been tested. He's, he's made some saves. He's made some saves when need be. I find that he's, he's let up a couple weak ones and it's going to come down to when you're, you know, when you're playing against, you know, possibly a team like Sweden or the Russians or the Americans or et cetera, that are going to bring a lot more firepower than say Slovakia or Germany or depleted Germany roster. You know, is he going to be able to make those big saves when it matters most? And I think he'll be able to just based on the fact that Canadians defend so well and they're not going to allow for the high, like the high danger chances. Well, and I think that's what's gone against Levi so far in this tournament. They've defended so well that they've only given up, what, 10, 12 shots in a game at the most. Yeah, they so haven't. I don't, think they, I don't think he's, I don't think he's faced more than, I don't think you even think he's faced 20 shots. No, I think 12 was the most he's ever faced yeah. in a game. So he's not getting very much work. It's hard for a goalie to be in the game. So in my opinion, he has done better than I expected based on that, because if you're not facing the shots and you're not really being tested, you have to really focus hard on the game and try and stay in there. And despite a couple of goals that he could have gone, you know, he could have probably gotten otherwise considering the fact that he stood basically stood still for 10 minutes before those shots even got to him. I don't think he'd sell that bad. Honestly, yeah, absolutely. Treg put, uh, put uh, the question mark on goaltending for the Canadian, for the Canadian team before the tournament. And he was right. But I think Levi is showing that he could step up. Now the big tests are going to come in the next couple of games. So this is where they're really going to need Levi to step up and make those saves. If, if he lets in a weak goal, uh, that's not going to bode well. No, no. Like, you know, as we record today, uh, it's quarterfinals day. The Canadians are going to take on uh, the Czechs. Um, Canadians prospect uh, Jan Mysak is the um, is the captain of that team. He he looks hungry. And this is a team that uh, this is a team that defeated the Russians. So if they come to play, then this is this is going to be a team that um they're going to, they're going to give, they, they could potentially give Canada a little bit of trouble. And as you said, if, you know, they go down early one week goal, that could be all it takes. Uh, if you look at Canada too, they had kind of a rough going into this. They, they had maybe one or two practices before they had to shut down for COVID. Uh, so they really, before the tournament started, they really didn't get a lot of work in. And as goaltenders, as it's, since we're, I'll just go back on the goaltending, they need that work. They need to see the pucks. They need to get the, they need to feel the puck. Uh, you'll hear that a lot by ex goalies on, on TV that now I, I goaltend on the cross, but it's the same basic concept and Blaine they hit the nail on the head. If you're standing around for 10 minutes, just watching the play, you know, and not really doing anything. Uh, it takes a lot of focus and concentration to stay in the game. Yeah. Uh, then you get thinking cause you, and the worst thing a goalie can do is start thinking uh, because then you overthink. Uh, I think Levi's played good. The three goals he allowed in, I'm going to say two of them, he probably could have had. Uh, but then again, it's a mental thing. And I, I, I'm not going to sit, I, I'm not going to sit here and say, 
all we he was a shitty goalie because he let those two goals in. Martin Brodeur let a bad goal in almost every game. He didn't have a shutout. So, uh, you know, like uh, the Canadian defense is good enough in front of him that one bad goal is not going to be an issue. Uh, you're absolutely right. I don't think the uh, Czech Republic is going to be their big test. I, I think Canada should do well against them. I'm not saying it's going to be a blowout. Slovakia, as Blaine pointed out, they really should have done better against them, but maybe you could chalk that up to just an off day. And if their off day is a 4-1 win, then I'll, I'll take that going forward. It's when they, if they have to face Sweden or Russia or the USA is when it's really going to uh, be the test. And we're really going to see how good the goaltending is for, for Canada in a game like that. The United States leads the entire league in shots on goal uh, for the tournament. So they shoot from everywhere. So, and, uh, and the way Zagris is shooting and putting the puck in the net, Levy's really going to have to be on his game if they play the United States at some point. So, okay. Yeah. So right now for them to play the United States, so obviously we don't know the outcomes of these games. There might be, um, there might be an upset here and there. I, with the way that the matchups are right now, I can't really see an upset. Um, you know, the chances of Germany upsetting the Russians is probably going to be pretty low. Same thing as, Slovakia defeating the United States. Um, it's going to really come down to who wins between Finland and Sweden about who's going to go on to the next one. I would like to say that the Swedes are going to bounce back and um, finally get a win when it counts um, during the medal round. Well, they're not winning when it doesn't count right now. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> and um, it's going to come down to their goaltending. So based on that, you would see during the restructure of the semifinals, you would see Canada play Sweden in the next round, followed by the United States and Russia, where the Russians beat the United States in the preliminary round. So it could make for a really good uh, uh, rematch. So now, did they change the whole way they do this for this year? Did they not? Instead of having the two top team play the bottom team, top team of Pool A play bottom team of Pool B as and flip-flop as you keep going – they're actually going to pull everyone together after the quarterfinals and it's just best team faces worst yeah, after team the, after the quarterfinals. Yeah, yeah. You'll have the top seat. The top seat will play the, the whoever's number one will play number four or the next highest. Right. Mm. So the only team that Canada cannot play in the semis is the United States. So, so it, should be, gonna, it should be exciting to watch. So if they play the States, it'll be the gold medal game. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Unless they both lose, it'll be a bronze medal. Yeah. Gooley versus Caulfield. Well, is that going to be a matchup? According to Twitter hockey, Habs Twitter, Caulfield's a big bust. And uh, based on this this one tournament, uh, he's never going to score a goal in the NHL. So, uh, well, I mean, it's the it's the game to see who's the bigger bust. I mean, I'm going to bring this up. I wrote an article about how. uh, Caulfield had to have a good world junior championship. Now the way I wrote it, I was more to say if he wants the confidence and wants to get to Montreal on a fast track, this tournament will help boost him to go there. But it was more based on, he needs a good performance in this world juniors. This just shut some people up because for some reason, everyone wants Cole Caulfield to fail. And I don't know why. It just seems to me if you read articles and you look at hockey Twitter or Habs Twitter or Habs Facebook, for some reason, everyone wants Caulfield to fail. Everyone ignores the fact that he, at the time he left, he was leading the NCAA in points, uh, the entire NCAA, not just the Big Ten. On a shit team. On a shit team. He was he was carrying the offense by himself because Holloway was gone, and he's the only other good player on the team. No, no, sorry, he's to the say, greatest. sorry to say your team's really shitty, Jenny, but your team's really shitty. Sorry. Yeah. It's true. I mean, you know, I mean, it, it's true. It, it's, it's a terrible team. Like, just I've watched every one of their games, and I'm like, I thought at times I was watching the Cole Harbor Cavaliers play the, uh, you know, that would be my old high school team, playing somebody. That's, it's just, but when you watch, him and even in this tournament when you watch him he's controlling the offense he's controlling the puck he's playing a good two-way game i'm going to say this and we talked about it before the show people are going to say this is an excuse the coach isn't putting him in in the position he needs to be in he should not be in the slot 
when he's in the offensive zone. No, he all be. they're doing is putting two guys on him, and he's just standing there. Yeah, that's well, it. We've brought this up. Like, Kaliev should be in the slot on the power play. Yeah, on the power. But play, even yeah. I find even not on the power play for some reason, they want Caulfield to go in the center position, and yeah, doesn't really make too much sense. Doesn't make any sense. No, especially when all his goals are scored um, coming at uh, as a cone, a cone yep. shape coming off the the net. Yeah. He's along the edges of that cone. So he's he's darting in and out of the dirty areas, but he's finding those those little quiet zones and he kind of sneaks into it and then rifles a quick shot off as soon as it touches his stick. But if he goes mm-hmm. into this high slot, the defender's right on him. He's not moving, he's static. It takes he's- away every every part of his game that makes him dangerous. And he's not big and strong enough to move that defender off him. Well, no. No, he's well, five I- foot seven, 180 <clears throat> pounds. If you really look at him, he, if you watch his game, he always finds the open ice. Yeah. Always. When he's playing on the sides, he's always, fi- he's always open. And either the passes aren't getting to him or when they do get to him, by the time he gets a shot off the goal, he's already there to make it. And he's had in that game uh, that they won 11 nothing or whatever their big, sh- he got no points. He had seven shots and three posts. Yeah. And, you know, like, sure. Who cares about shots and that? Well, I care about shots because that's just because you're not scoring doesn't mean you're not playing well. It's and the quality what, of the shot too. He's getting them from, from dangerous areas. And, and, and then I, the problem with people is all they're, all they're doing is looking at goals and points and going, Oh, yeah. this guy's a bust. Cause he only has three points in four games. He's a bust. I'm going to, tr- I'm going to trigger some people here. Trigger warning. Caulfield is the next patch ready. I think he's going to score 40 goals with patch ready. Never did. But he's that kind of player. Pacioretty was never the guy to go to the front of the net. He was always, always coming from the sides, coming in off the rush, finding those little quiet spots to take a quick shot. If you put him in the high slot, how good was Pacioretty in a high slot? He sucked. And he's six foot two, two ten. But as good as what he was on the uh, in the shootout. (laughs) In the shootout, he was horrible. Exactly. He He was great on empty nets. (laughs) <laughs> but no this is the it, but this is the kind of player that Caulfield is he's he's a guy that he needs he needs to generate the confusion off of a rush off of motion he's not a static player they there has to be movement there has to be motion and that's where he he generates all his offense you see it in in uh, Wisconsin all the all the goals that he scores or sets up they're all based on transitional play or just in the right place yeah moving moving the puck around a little bit to create that confusion to create the motion even his goal in this tournament was off a transition play on the power play yeah and how many chances he had on the rush he was coming down the side on the rush guy got the puck to him he beat the guy to the net and got a good shot snapped a five hole yeah so um maybe tonight will come out with four points and everyone will shut up i don't know no could, could very well happen if, no, if you really look at it, Byfield's only had one good game in this entire tournament. That's right. Yeah. And it just so happens points he got six wise, points. Yeah. And it just so happens he got six points. But it could wake him up, though. It, it could. could. Yeah. The next game, Byfield got nothing. Yeah, but he played well. He played he, very but well. He, but he played well the whole tournament. That's my point. He's been playing well. Byfield was playing well. Yeah, but he didn't play with the confidence he did in that last game. In the first two games, he was he was kind of hesitant. In this last game, he was physical. And that's fine. And, he, yeah. and I'm not saying Byfield hasn't played well. I'm just saying you're, you're everyone's. I guess I'm just tired of everyone going on about Caulfield because he's not scoring. Well, watch him play. Yeah. Watch him play, and then come back and tell me how unconfident you are about him. Yeah. What I want to put out there though is how many of the same people that are calling Caulfield the bust because he doesn't have enough points in the World Juniors were calling Paling the next great superstar when he was the tournament MVP. That's very true. Or when he scored that hat trick in his opening game. Or how many people now are saying how Alex DeBrinyak is probably the best small player, small forward in the NHL when his first World Junior Championship, he had three points. And his second World Junior Championship, he never made the team because he was cut. Exactly. So if you're going to base everything off this tournament, and I do understand why people do. It's a big, important tournament. If you're going to base everything off this tournament, though, then I'm not to be ignorant, but your hockey knowledge just isn't very high. This is not the end-all, be-all. 
No. So we've talked about Caulfield. We've talked a little bit about um, Team Canada. Who, other than a Canadian player, or if you want to pick a Canadian player, go right ahead. Name a few if you want. Um, who stood out for you at this tournament? Zegers. Zegers has been impressive, but Stutzel for me. Stutzel, I think Stutzel yeah. because as the German team was missing a lot of pieces because of people having to stay in their rooms for COVID, playing shorthanded, and Stutzel picked that team up and carried them. He has done extremely well in this tournament. He's impressed me. I'd, I'd say Stutzel as well. There's there's really been no player that has meant so much to his respective team. He's he's always on the puck. He's always looking for the openings. He's on the body. Like who was it? it was was it Byram that he hit into the bench in the first game? Uh, um, yeah, I, I believe yeah. so. Like you know, yeah. I, I, you know, I. It kind of pains me that he's going to end up going to the Senators, but you know they got they're getting yeah. a good, they're getting a good player. They're getting a very good player. And another guy that I'd like to just really quickly give a shout out to is the Austrian goalie. I can't say his last name. Um, Sebastian Ranisites or whatever the hell I cannot say his last name. I, I had it. I'm not going to try. I'm not even going to try. Well, and uh, he faced uh, 194 shots in this tournament. Germany you can just hear you can you can just hear the Austrian goaltender now. Yeah, <laughs> but like you know, I I give it to him. He gave his chance. He gave his team a chance to win. Like he, it was not his. It was not his fault that his team didn't make it to the next round. Let's just say no. That. And and let's give Austria a little bit of credit here. Next year they're going to have a few returning players. Yeah, they're gonna they're gonna have a better showing. They'll probably even win a game. Yeah, we got no, well, look at it this way. And, and we brought this up in the last show um, when um, Cicero tweeted out about, um, about, 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 about team, you know, about teams that uh, aren't, you know, Canada, U.S., you know, the hockey powers, if they should even be in the tournament. But we're looking at a game right now with, uh, with Germany. And this is Germany's first ever game playing in the quarterfinals. So yeah. right there, so right there is progression. Well, just to give you a little insight, if you look at the top five scoring leaders in the tournament, three, uh, four, and five are all Germany: Stutzel, yeah. Paterka, and Elias. And Elias cool. just scored as we record. They're playing Russia. Just scored to make it two to one. I'm sorry. All I heard was relegate this team because the tournament's <laughs> just too weak. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, like it's 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 ridiculous. And 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 we've seen and we brought this up. I said on the last show, and we've seen some very good players come out of these non-traditional hockey markets in the last few years. One of them was a one of them was a, a first overall pick, and that was Heischer. Yeah. Well, look at Marco Rossi for Austria. Yeah. Would would uh, people be this excited about? Rossi if he hadn't have been able to play in this kind of tournament or to lead his team last season in division two to win that tournament, to move up to this one. That's right. No, screw it. Don't grow the game. Just keep it to the big powerhouses and everyone will be happy. <laughs> yeah. Growing the game is a bad idea, especially it's financially. Terrible. 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 So it's just a terrible idea. So before Let's, let's do a quick breakdown before we move on. Uh, we'll do our gold medal, bronze medal prediction. So based on the games today, um, Russia and Germany. Oh, you know what? That. Well, yeah. I'm, I'm going to say Germany just because I'm watching it and uh, the Germany's really coming on. And they just made it two to one. Okay. I'll, I'll, say, I'll say Russia. Russia is going to win, but I'm going to say Probably. Germany anyway. Uh, Sweden, Finland. <laughs> Finland. I think Finland's going to take that one. I'm going to agree with Blaine. I'm going to go with Finland. Okay, I'm going to go with the Swedes because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a little, you know, I, I'd like to see them get back on their winning ways. Defensive it's, it's, superstar, Toronto Maple Leafs uh, pick in the Millennium or whatever the hell his name is. Oh, Topi oh in that case, I'm changing my pick yeah. to Sweden. Sweden it is. Milan, he's playing for for Finland, so. I'm changing my pick to Sweden now. Okay, we're going to Sweden. And according um, to all the, all the Toronto fans, he's the greatest defenseman that ever played in the tournament. I think we can both agree. I think we can all agree that Canada will likely defeat the Czechs. 
Oh yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And the United States will defeat Slovakia. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so based on two to one um, for a couple of those picks, we're gonna assume Canada plays Sweden in the semifinals. Who do you got winning that one? Canada. 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 Canada's okay, so winning can- all the medals. It's gonna be gold, yeah. silver, and bronze for Canada. I don't know why they bother with this tournament. Relegate everybody else. So we got Canada in the finals facing either Russia or the U.S. Who do you got? I got the U.S. Okay. Russia, U.S. I'm going to yeah. go with U.S. on this because they uh, they're going to be bitter after that loss. Okay. And uh, Spencer Knight has really picked up his game since the yeah. uh, since that first uh, game where he got pulled. Um, I'm going to go uh, just to be different on this one. I am going to go with Russia. I think that um, they beat them once. I think they can do it again, but. It works again, two to one. Um, so we'll say Canada, U.S. in the final. Canada. Canada, I would say Canada, Canada would beat the U.S. in the final. And we'll go and with... U.S. Uh, is going to be relegated because they lost. <laughs> and we'll say Sweden and uh, Russia for the bronze. Russia. Russia. I would say so, I don't, too. I don't think Sweden's going to medal. So we're looking at Canada, Canada for gold, U.S. silver. Russia for bronze. Okay. Well, this is a New Year's tradition, right? This tournament. It's a big New Year's tradition. Everyone loves it. Everyone has fun with this. So uh, those are those predictions are fun. And being that it's New Year's, I want to wish a happy New Year's from our sponsor, Manscaped. Uh, Manscaped is the best in men's below-the-waist grooming, offering precision engineered tools for your family jewels. It is here to help you have clean balls in the new year. Ring in the new year with the right tools for the job. Manscaped is here to give you a new year's resolution that you'll actually want to keep. The perfect package 3.0 is the below the waist grooming package you need to start off strong this year. Come out of quarantine with clean balls thanks to the lawnmower 3.0. It's also time to freshen up down there in the new year with the crop preserver, an anti-chafing ball deodorant and moisturizer. I love this stuff, it works great. Uh, You always put deodorant on your armpits. Why are you not putting deodorant on the smelliest part of your body? And for on-the-go freshness, you'll love the Crop Reviver Ball Toner Spray. Manscaped even threw in their Shed Travel Bag to keep all your goodies stored comfortably. Speaking of comfort, the Manscaped Anti-Chafing Boxer Briefs are also included and will bring your underwear game to the next level. Bring sexy back in 2021 and get 20% off plus free shipping with the code unfiltered20 at manscaped.com. Your balls will thank you. Remember, get 20% off and free shipping with the code unfiltered20 at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com. Use code unfiltered20. New year, new balls. It works so well. One night, my wife actually said maybe. (laughs) <laughs> yeah she said, wow that doesn't smell as bad as it normally does maybe. she said maybe i said hey honey and she went eh, maybe never happened but i was close it was strong it was, a maybe. Close. it was a strong maybe it's a it's much better than the strong oh hell no it's much better it's than the look i don't even get that- the hell no i just get that look like what who are you and the snort <laughs> yeah <laughs> I'll be back in an hour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Here, here's, here's some Vaseline. Go away. <laughs> uh, by then, I'm just like, ah, whatever. I'm going to go to bed. All right. So we talked about the World Juniors. We talked about New Year's. We talked about shaving our balls. Um, my sack. Now, Let's talk about my sack. <laughs> Me on shack. To, on to something a little bit more of a closer shave. Um Claude Julian season coming up. He's under the gun, I think. What do you guys think? Treg? Uh, uh, if they start off slow, he's fired. Uh, Bergman put this team together to win. He's in a win now mode. I don't care what anyone puts it. I, again, I'm not saying Montreal's a contender to win the cup. Uh, I don't, but it, it's hard. See, it's hard for me to say that because I think they have a team that's built for the playoffs and could do a long playoff run. I don't think they have the talent to be called a contender, if that makes any sense to anyone. Um, 
I think they are a definite playoff team under normal circumstances, normal season. I think it would be no, there'd be no reason for us to sit there and think that they're not going to make it uh, under a 56 game schedule. We said last week, a fi- or actually just the other day for a New Year's special, we said a five-game losing streak could might end your end your season. Um, so Julian's under the gun. He, he he has all the all the pieces put in there uh, to run a team the way he wants it run because everybody that's on this team is a Julian type player, except maybe Drew in and that. But even you need a couple of those guys. But they're all Drew uh, a Julian type players, and this is a team built for success under this coach. And if there is none, there's really only one person to blame. Bergie's not going to fire himself. So that, that's it for Julian special teams is going to be the key this year. So if they don't figure out the special teams, you might even see maybe Muller or some of the assistants go first and then Julian. But if Montreal starts to see Vanas say five and 10, I think he's gone. Yeah. Yeah. If um, so, my view is that Bergevin's job is safe no matter what happens this year, mm-hmm. but it's his last chance. Yeah. And his last chance means Julian had better step up and produce. So I think you're right. If he has a, a f- even a five game moving, losing streak at any point in the season, he is done because Bergevin is under the gun. And if he doesn't make that move to try and shake the guys awake again, then he's not doing everything he possibly can. And then by the end of next season, he's gone. So, I mean, Bergevin's done his job. He's done his job. He's improved the team. He filled the holes. So you can get mad at Bergevin if you want, but he's not coaching the team. So if you're going to get mad at him, get mad at him because he kept the coach too long. That's what you got to get mad at him. Well, every point he mentioned in the off season after the, uh, the playoffs, everything he said, he went out and he filled those holes. Yep. He said he needed more more uh, more grit in the back end. He got he got that. He needed a backup. He got that. He needed more scoring. He got that. He needed size up front. He got that. And he gave Julian essentially a Julian style team, the type of team that Julian loves to coach. So if he doesn't step, if for whatever reason, whether it's his fault or not, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. They're, they're gonna he's gonna get fired if he cannot get this team to play well they can't uh and in a short season you cannot allow a losing streak like four or five games in a row you can't allow that you pretty much have to maintain a 550 600 winning percentage just to ensure you're in the playoffs at the end of the year yeah you almost have to yeah matt what do you think yeah i think he's got definitely going to be on a short leash um mark bergevin has really made a team that um on paper is probably one of the best canadians team that we've seen in many, many years. Um, they're fast. They've got skill. They can, they'll, they should be able to score by committee and not have to worry about uh, just one guy potting the goals. Shouldn't have to worry about just one line contributing. Um, you've got guys that played on the first and second line this year that now are going to be playing on the third and fourth line. So you bring in guys like Josh Anderson, who should be able to create space for Drew and Suzuki. Um, you bring in Foley. You, uh, you upgrade your power play, you upgrade your um, your uh, your backup goaltending, bringing in Jake Allen. You've got some uh, youth injected in the lineup with a uh, with Alexander Romanov. You've got um, Suzuki that's looked to take that's looking to take the next step, as well as um, Kotkaniemi. Plus, you've got guys that are going to be trying to make the team. Um, it's what Treg said, um, this is a team that's built for a playoff run. They just have to make it there first. However, you guys are both correct. If something happens that they do go on a losing streak, then his, I don't think they're going to give him much of a chance. And um, his days in Montreal could be, uh, could come to an end. And if that's the case, I believe that uh, a guy like uh, Jura Gallant could be on uh, speed dial. That's very possible. Right. Someone that's already been with the Canadians organization that has yeah. had quite a bit of success as a head coach. And is already in French. Canada. No, no, he doesn't speak French, but he has, he has the experience. He has a French You know what? Name. With, with Gallant, I don't think anyone's going to care. I don't think most people care regardless. But... No, they don't. 
Well, anyway, we're not, we're not and, here to get into that, but. And to keep in mind too, um, anybody they hire, if they're already in Canada, they don't have to worry about the 14 days. They can, they can get away with seven days with, uh, with two tests. So Gallant is in, I believe, PEI right now. So he would have to go to the team, isolate for a week, take two tests, and then he'd be able to join the team. I'll so, ask Lyle Richardson where, uh, where Gallant is. He should know. He's over in PEI. Yeah. <laughs> but it's going to be, for me, it's going to be interesting to see how these line combinations are going to look. We, um, we've kind of thrown a couple at the wall. Um, you know, is the Genoa line going to stay together? Is, you know, who's, who, who, are they gonna, so. who are they going to put with, um, you know, are they going to continue to play Suzuki with Drouin with, with the, with the success that they saw in the playoffs, you know, who's going to go, or, you know, what uh, wing is to going to play on who's going to play with, um, um, with Romanov, et cetera. There's so many what ifs right now. And uh, it's something to look forward to. Like you, you just brought in a veteran guy, like, um, like Corey Perry, is he going to be a regular? What's he going to bring? How hungry is he going to be? How much of a pest is he going to be? Well, right. Like these are, these are the questions here that we're all asking. And um, this is, this is an exciting time to be a Canadians fan. And tomorrow the questions are going to start being answered because tomorrow uh, this yeah, is their training seasons open. Uh, but you, you hit the nail on the head there, Matt. There's a lot of guys that are lineup. So like Byron, uh, Frolik, Perry, uh, Ryan Paling, and uh, Jake Evans. Like yep. these guys, they're all going to be battling for uh, – the only thing that bothers me right now about the Canadians is the fact they're going with three young guys at center. And that's pretty much the only thing that, that kind of I'm hesitant about. Uh, not, that it, not, not that any of their play has suggested it's going to be worse. However, you just got to think – you know, do we really want to? I would have liked to seen another veteran center come into the uh, into the fold. I was kind of thinking. I was kind of thinking the same thing, but um, for instance, if they put Armia Lekkinen or uh, or Perry or someone like that on Evans' wing, you're going to at least have a veteran presence. Oh, I, I, exactly. Right? So exactly. He's going to be able yeah. to be insulated a little bit, but from the games that he played. Um, he didn't look out of place, and if he wouldn't have got rocked in the playoffs, I think he would have played, done a lot better, right? Yeah. So he's only going to play about nine minutes a game anyway. So yeah, but uh, you just got to hope that Suzuki and uh, Cotton and Amy go forward. There's a lot of ifs in the Canadian team. Yeah. Yes, on paper they're good. Yes, this, but there's still there's still quite a few. Is Romanoff going to be the guy that the entire Canadians management and coaching staff thinks he's going to be? Uh, is Suzuki and KK going to move forward? I think all of this is going to be a yes, but again, it's a, it's an if. And this, this brings me to the next topic that we're going to cover uh, predictions. So the train, you mentioned it, Treg, uh, training camp starts on Sunday, the third for the Canadians. It's already started for the seven teams that weren't part of that play in. Um, so why don't we do some predictions? Let's have some fun with this. Um, I'll let you start, Treg, because I interrupted you. Um, you got three predictions? Like based on like who's going to be top scorer on all this yeah, kind of whatever, stuff? Or? Anything to do with, uh, with the Canadians. Three predictions uh, for this season. My first prediction is that Romanov's going to start on the first line uh, with uh, paired with Weber. Uh, my next prediction is uh, Josh Anderson's going to lead them in scoring with 20 goals. And I think, uh, uh, I don't know. I think, uh, I think Drew is going to lead the team in points. Drew in or Suzuki. That's my what prediction. What's your, Matt? You got, uh, you got any predictions? Uh, for me, I think, um, Suzuki takes the next step forward. I think he's going to lead the team in points. Um, I think we're going to see another career year for Jeff Petrie. And uh, well, obviously with a 56, you know, pro rated, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think we're going to see another really good year out of him. And uh, I think we're going to really see the importance of Jake Allen. I think um, we're going to see a rejuvenated. Um, we're going to see an even better carry price because he knows that he's got somebody that's going to be there to support him. And with the amount of 
uh, back-to-backs that they have, which I believe is nine in this 56-game season, it's going to come up really big. I think Allen's going to be um, one of the most important pieces um, that Bergman picked up during the offseason. I think so. Uh, for me, um, I'm, I'm going to say that the Canadians are going to have at least seven players that finish on average, like pro rated, of course, seven players on a 20 goal pace. So over an 82 game season, that would be seven 20 goal players. I think that's what they're going to have on this lineup. I think because of that, their power play is going to be much more improved, uh, probably in the top 15 with about 21, 22% uh, success rate. Uh, I think, I also think Romanov is going to be a top four player by the end of the year. And I mean, steady, not just starting, you know, a couple of shifts with, uh, with Weber and I'm going to go out on a massive limb. I know this is a crazy one because it's just out of left field, but I think Paul Byron's going to be gone by the end of the year. I've Sorry, been saying Beth. that for months. <laughs> Sorry, Beth from happy hour. Byron's gone. I hope Matt Day goes with him. <laughs> oh, we, we, we talked about Byron in the yeah. past, and it's just the lineup that, that that they it's 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 hard to keep in the lineup when you bring in two scoring forwards. When you bring in Anderson, when you bring in Toffoli, it brings the defensive guys down the lineup. And we saw Armia is an absolute beast on the penalty kill, and he can stick handle in a phone booth and he had a breakout season offensively last year and he was doing very well prior to his injury. Um, and he's got size. He four checks, see this, see that. It's just, I would pick him or Lekkonen over Byron any day of the, any day of the week. Well, if you look at it this way, if wheel were the center for the fourth line and Byron and Armia are the wingers, that's $7 million on a fourth line. That's hard to justify. So moving Byron out, that's three and a half, almost three and a half million dollars. That's half the cap hit of that le- of that line. And he, he can be replaced by uh, Frolik or Perry, who are yeah. making $750,000. The so, issue with that is you have to find the team to take the three and a half million in the flat cap. Yeah, you're going to have to sweeten the deal, but there are teams that could take that on. Colorado, so, Boston. Boston needs a winger. I'm just throwing out teams I need to go to. I'm just saying, but I uh, I truly think that Perry's going to crack the lineup. Yeah, probably, probably. That he's going to be, you know, they're going to they're going to either put him on a line, and it's hard to say, but I kind of like a line of um, to Foley, Kakaniemi, and Perry. I don't know if he's going to play that high in the lineup. Because I then think, you could have Lekin and Evans and um, Lekin and Evans are me as your third, as your fourth line, but still kind of play them, you know, a little bit. I, I, I don't know, Matt, because Kanye and Emmy has a little bit of grit to him. He has a little bit of size to him. He, he throws the body. He let, he led the team in hits in the playoffs. Yeah. Uh, he, he can go in the corners. He got in that. He, he's been known to drop the gloves. He only did it yeah. once, but so he destroyed really, Hag. And so do you re? I don't know. Like I see what you're saying. I, I, I'm not against it, but I, I just don't see. I would like to see a Tafoli Katyemi Armia line personally. Um, yeah, it's, and, I think it's going to come down to what wing Tafoli is going to play on. Yeah. It's if he plays on if he plays on the left, you're probably going to put Armia on that line. If he plays on the right, you're probably going to put Lekin on, on that line. Or unless Armia can play left, I don't. I don't know, but yeah. I, I I can see Perry there once in a while, you know, a shift here, shift there. But Perry to me is just a fourth liner at this point. He's a guy that'll play eight minutes a game, 10 minutes a game. He'll go out, you know, in specific situations, if only to piss off the other team, especially against the Western conference teams, you know, the, the Western Canada teams in those, in this, uh, this year. Oh, you, you know, Edmonton despises him. Calgary hates him. And it's a pretty safe bet Vancouver does too. You're going to so. see him in any game that has Kachuk or Luchik in it, whether it's Ottawa yeah. or Calgary, you're going to see Perry in the lineup. And he's going to be greasy as hell. He's going to be throwing cheap shots and just uh, have fans be ready. Cause this guy is not just an agitator because he chirps guys. 
he's an agitator because he'll slew foot someone. He'll, he'll spear him. He'll, he'll butt in. He'll cross check. He just, he's greasy, greasy hockey player. And I love it. It's, I think he's going to really help. In the, I think he's going to help out of the power play. He could on the second wave. Yep. Yeah, he could. 100% put him in front of the net and just let him do his thing. I know they're going to have to have a good PK because uh, he does take a lot of penalties. He does. Yeah. <laughs> So. so I actually had someone tell me on Twitter after I, uh, I mentioned, you know, Perry got signed. They're like, oh, here comes Perry. He's going to score 20 goals for the Montreal Canadiens. Like, yeah, no, no, no. No. Maybe but seven. do you guys think Maybe. anybody's going to crack 20 in this shortened I think season? Anderson like legit will get 20. 20. You think I Anderson? Think Ander- I think he'll hit 20. I, I think, I, you know what, Gallagher, I think we could have two or three people hit 20, even in a 56-game season. Uh, it, it's not – Gallagher could do it. Anderson could do it. Uh, uh, Drew Ang could do it if he's on his game. Um, I think you're right. I think we have pro rated. We have seven to eight. Right now on paper, we have eight players that can score 20 goals because either they have or they were on pace for 20 and injuries happened or something like that from the past. <clears throat> of course, you're not all eight are going to do that, but I think you could have six or seven guys who could pro rate 70 goals or 20 goals, not 70, but, um, and what is this NHL 94 with the one timer? <laughs> Jesus. And, and, uh, well, and I, I do believe that Montreal has the firepower now. Now, do they have an elite star player? No, they do not. No, well, carry price, but offensively, no, they do not. But I forget what coach said it, but someone said, I would rather have a team full of 20 goal scores than two 50 goal scores. Probably Julian because that's his that's his wet dream, and uh, I was it was an older coach. I, I want to say Don Cherry, but I don't know if it was, was Don Cherry or not. But uh, honestly, it's a lot harder to defend against a team that has seven twenty goal scorers than one fifty goal scorer. If you got two guys on each line that can put the puck in the net, then that's two guys on each line you have to defend against. And who do and, you who do you put your best defenseman against? Exactly. So this year for Montreal, who's your best defenseman going against? Gallagher, Suzuki, Anderson, Buffoli, Druin. Yeah, it's Tatar in there too. Tatar. I'm expecting Tatar to take a step backwards this year, but that's just me. Um, I still think he'll be on a pace for 20 goals. He won't be a you know on pace for over 60 points kind of thing. But yeah. the thing is, they're not going to have to utilize him as much offensively. No, he's still he'll still be seen as an offensive weapon, but. but um, the puck's not always going to have to go to his, to, to be on his stick because you you brought in guys like Anderson who's going to really have something to prove, and to Foley who has been quite consistent over his career. He's a prolific shooter. He he shoots constantly. He averages about ten shots a game. He's so. like Michael Ryder. <laughs> yeah, but even, even has the net. number. <laughs> yeah, but I'm number. just saying he's like Michael Michael Ryder shot from everywhere. He just yeah. he, hey, I got thirty goals. Yeah, but you had seven hundred shots. So yeah. whatever, <laughs> whatever works for you. Uh, that well, means he got the puck a lot. Yeah. Tafoya had 203 shots last year. Yeah. Shot at 11.8%. Just do that again. And you're looking at someone that's on pace for 20 to 25 goals. Yeah. On pace. I mean, you don't, you don't need a guy with a 25% shot rate playing on your third line. But it'd be nice. It'd be nice. But you, I'm just saying if, if he still gets his 20 goals, but he's shooting, you know, 12 times a game. I'm good with that. If you're scoring two goals, that means guys like cotton Yemi have been generating possession. That means yeah. the Canadians have been holding possession over three lines at over 60%. And, and if that's the case, the Canadians will be a dominant hockey team. I don't think that's going to happen, but Holy shit. Wouldn't that be nice? Well, the last two years, the Montreal Canadians were one of the best five on five teams in the league. Yeah. And the problem was they just couldn't put the puck in the net. Now they, they have guys more. that can put the puck For in. me, you bring in a guy like Anderson and like, let's just forget about last season. Um, during the 18-19 season, scored 27 goals and 22 of them were even strength. And he was playing on the third line. And then you look at Toffoli last year, he scored 24 goals and 19 of them were on even strength. So you already have a team that really excels when it comes to playing five on five. And now you bring in two guys that score the majority of their goals five on five. So it's, it's going to be very good for them. 
neither uh, well Anderson for instance did not get a lot of power play time so he's going to see more power play time so maybe that uh, that pace increases a little bit because he's going to be right there at the net constantly harassing goaltenders and he can kill penalties too he's, he's quick he for can. a big guy yeah so can Toffoli Toffoli led the league in shorthanded goals four or five years ago yeah in like his third season which but, just uh, proves uh, the need for Byron has gone down because more people can penalty kill. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I mean, right now with the way the Montreal Bergevin has this lined out is, and we talked about this before uh, Blaine, you've brought it up a few times. There's no one, two, three, four lines. There's we'll roll out this line, this line, this line. You're going to see the top two lines probably almost play identical minutes with the third line not far behind and the fourth line filling in when need to. Yep. And that's just the way Julian loves it. So it goes, it, we, we're circling back to this. This team is built for Julian's system. It's built to succeed in a playoff type style uh, uh, games or seasons. And that's exactly what we're going to have for 56 plus games. 56 games is going to be a playoff style game because if you look at all the uh, schedules, they're going to play the same team two or three times in a row uh, and then move on to the next team. And then you're going to hit the playoffs. And this is what this team is built for. Now injuries are the th big thing is injuries that that's, we get injuries start piling up and then your season's going to go down the tubes. And then that's at the very least difference. with all these new additions, we're more insulated against injuries. Correct. It's not like last year where one or two injuries ends your year. Now, and now if they have one or two guys down hurt, they've got a couple extra pieces that can step in. See, the yeah. thing that would really hurt them, you know, knock on wood, would be if they lose someone down the middle. Like if they lose, yeah. say if they lost Suzuki or if or, or even on defense, if they lost Weber or Petrie, that could be that could be a big loss for them. Yeah. But they do have a hell of a lot more depth than what they used to, and you don't have to rely on. And you know, I'm not throwing the guy under the bus, but you're not having to work to rely on somebody like Belzil or Dale Weiss or but someone you know. like or someone like that have to come in from Laval and play, you know, five six minutes a night, right? You or, do. You don't. Yeah. Or you don't right. have a guy like Paling playing on the fourth line, never touching the puck and wondering why he's not being successful. That's right. Yeah. Like right now you've got the taxi squad. You've got um, a guy like for That's going to be a depth guy. You've got Byron who's potentially going to be a depth guy. Um, Corey Perry is potentially going to be a depth guy, et cetera. Um, and then on defense, you're going to have either Kulak or Mete as a, uh, as a seventh defenseman. So You've got a team that's got a little bit more depth than what they normally would usually have. So, as I said, training camp starts tomorrow. It's an exciting time to be a fan. And, and, and you that, have depth that can actually succeed, not just you're yeah. throwing a guy in to fill a hole. Yeah, 100%. And, uh, on that note, I think uh, I think we'll end the show here. Um, want to thank everybody who's listened to us over the, uh, the last couple of seasons. Uh, it's a new year, so... I believe our show is resolved to putting out more content for you and thank you for listening more often. So thank you for listening. This is more content. This is two shows in the same year. <laughs> Whoa. So uh, again, thanks for listening guys uh, and gals. The more you guys click, the more we like it, especially Matt. You click Matt and he just gets all excited. Very true. Giddy as a schoolgirl. Again, remember, there's the OnlyFans page. Check that out. So, uh, again, thank you for listening, and we will, we will meet with you on the next episode.